India's ancient gods and the great river Ganges. But here in Varanasi, people eventually came to embrace the railway age. To bathe in the Ganges is for many a holy rite, and the railways made that possible for millions of pilgrims. The railways seem to be a force for good, but India's spiritual leader, the great nationalist Mahatma Gandhi, did not approve. Gandhi argued that the railways soon devalued the purity of pilgrimages. The wrong sort of people were attracted. He wrote, the holy places of India have become unholy. Formerly, people went to these places with very great difficulty. Generally, therefore, only the real devotees visited such places. Nowadays, rogues visit them to practice their roguery. But the economic effect on religious centers such as Vanasi was incredible. Quickly, pilgrimages became big business. And even now, on a typical day, a million people will come here. Most of them will travel by train. What is it representing? What are we doing? Uh, we are uh, offering prayer to the Mother Ganges. Every evening, pilgrims from all over India make offerings at the water's edge. This is our way of thanking, thanking yeah. her. Thanking and offering our prayer. She uh, provides us salvation in the end. By the early 20th century, 35,000 miles of railway track had been built, carrying 80 million tons of goods every year. The railways were bringing industry, untapping India's vast natural resources and transporting nearly 500 million passengers. India as an idea became possible. Communities separated by vast distances, intense local traditions and a plethora of languages found often to their surprise that they could work well together. But one important figure, Mahatma Gandhi, endlessly attacked the railways as little more than evil. After becoming leader of the Indian National Congress, he gave full vent to his ideas on how the power and scale of the railways were the means by which Britain plundered India. An historian, Dr. Rudrangshu Mukherjee, is an expert on Gandhi. One part of him, the practical part of him, if you like, was reconciled to railways and the benefits that the railways brought in terms of travel. But as an idea, I don't think he ever accepted that modernity of which the railways were a part could be anything but evil. That's a very strong statement, isn't it? It is strong, but Gandhi strongly believed in this because he believed that the railways were bringing in modern, and by modern he meant Western slash industrial civilization into India. Which he disapproved of. Completely, because he believed industrial civilization was based on greed and violence, and he stood for non-violence. Therefore, railways were an agent of evil. Gandhi is also extolling the virtues of a simple life, and he says that good travels at a snail's pace, so he doesn't even like the speed of the railways. He didn't like the speed of anything, you know. He didn't believe that things could happen fast and overnight. He neither liked good traveling fast or goods traveling fast. In fact, he didn't believe goods should travel any great distance at all. You they should, should be self-sufficient self in, your, in and your they area. In that small little area that one lived in. Gandhi saw the railway's huge growth as a threat to Indian society itself, an exploitation of its resources, sucking away its wealth and destroying its culture. But there's a paradox at the heart of Gandhi's stance. The railways were the only way he could tour the country, and only by using the railways could nationalists literate across the subcontinent. 
Gandhi needed the railways he despised to turn himself into a nationalist hero. And on the 15th of August, 1947, it seemed Mahatma Gandhi and the nationalists had finally got their way. India became an independent state. But what should have been India's greatest moment would quickly turn into its greatest tragedy. Under the Raj, the two biggest communities, the Hindus and the Muslims, had managed to live together, often in separate areas, but not in separate states. The British held the ring. Only when independence was threatened by Muslims demanding a state of their own did the British reluctantly agree. West and East Pakistan were formed, but the partition of India would turn into a tragedy on an almost unbelievable scale, and a large part of that tragedy would be played out on the railways. Journalist Kuldeep Nair, a Hindu, was 25 when he discovered to his horror he was trapped on the Muslim side of the new frontier. I'm traveling with him to the Indian city of Amritsar, which is only 18 miles from the present day border with Pakistan. The railway station at Amritsar was a scene for an atrocity which left a terrible legacy. We're going to go to Amritsar because you have a personal story to tell, don't you, yes, about yes, partition. partition? And that's the place from where I crossed into India. Kuldip was from a small town called Sialkot in the Punjab. Because of partition, he, like millions of others, awoke one day to find himself no longer welcome in his own country. For many people, partition was the worst moment in Indian history. It was just so violent. One million people were killed. 20 million people were uprooting. It was a big mistake. Big mistake on the part of the British. Big mistake on the part of uh, Hindus who were uh, in a majority. And the biggest mistake on the part of the Muslims who got divided in three countries, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. So it was really, apart from the harm or what uh, devastation or the killing it, it but the first part is a mistake and we realize now, I think everybody in the subcontinent is realizing. it. As politicians desperately tried to make the new agreement work, millions of people took their lives into their own hands and fled in terror. The refugees wanted to escape as far and as fast as possible, and that meant traveling by train. The price of failure was often just all too apparent. Stations became battlegrounds. Bodies were abandoned. Where the refugees were trying to go depended solely on where they thought they could find a friendly reception. Muslims were desperate to travel across the Pakistan border. Hindus to go the other way, to India. The Sikhs of Amritsar were thankful their town and their holiest shrine was on the Indian side. That is the scene, isn't it? This is the one I see for the first time. Yeah. Even now, if we remember those days, we, f we tremble yeah. what was happening at that time. When we narrate these stories to our children, they Possibly. don't believe. They say they, they, you are just telling what is not uh, believable. They will throw them out of the train. And then they will go for other people. People yeah, no. killed and thrown on the track. Yeah. Yeah. It was a very bad scene. I mean, in India, you had to be uh, Hindu or Sikh. And in Pakistan, you have to be Muslim. You have to so be if Muslim. you are found on the other side, they will kill. It was a, it was a savage time. Wasn't yeah. It was a very, very terrible time. In just a few months, two and a half million people had crossed the borders in search of a new home. They were transported in almost 700 trains. Each journey carried the threat of sudden violence. So, could you take me back to that date in September? What happened? You were on the other side of the border. What happened then? I was running for 